All right, so I would say that most of the brothers are here, so I would say that we can go ahead and get started. Torsten, if you're if you're ready. Yeah, sure. We can go ahead and get started. Let's see. I'm gonna turn my camera back on. Gosh. Technology's wild. All the fun Microsoft Teams. Is uh is this what they have you guys use for like JSU stuff these days? Yeah, normally this is like online class kind of type deal. Oh wow. This is a lot nicer than I think it was like Blackboard Collaborate back when I was at JSU, but this is nicer than that. So good for you guys. <laughs> but uh but yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello to everybody tuning in. Um, I'm Torsten Dryden, Iota Lambda 400. Um, also serve on the uh, Alumni Advisory Board as the chair. So that's uh, for what that's worth. <laughs> but um, I'm happy to be here with you tonight to talk about wellness. Uh, so just to kind of give you a little bit of a background, about uh, what it is that I do and how that's relevant to what we're talking about tonight. So I am a licensed professional counselor, um, cl clinical mental health. Uh, I have a clinic here in town, just Dryden Counseling. I work with a variety of different ages, uh, you know, children, teens, adults with uh, varying mental health concerns, you know, ranging from just like basic day-to-day -day stressors all the way to like severe mental illness. So work with a variety of different clients uh, in that regard. And so <laughs> just on the chat. Hi, Jim, buddy. Hello. <laughs> this will be fun. OK, so not to get too sidetracked, but uh, yeah, so tonight we're going to talk about mental health and wellness, um, which when we think about mental health, typically you know, people tend to go like gear towards like the negative stuff like, you know, depression and severe anxiety, personality disorders, uh, you know, things of that nature. Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about positive psychology and like the positive aspects of mental health, which helps prevent some of the negative mental health. So I have to toss this out as a disclaimer that this is not, uh, you know, considered to be therapy. Like this is not a group therapy moment. This is more of like a psychoeducational moment. So I have to do that, you know, as per my ethic code um, for licensure. So just tossing that out there. Now, if we wanted to get some group therapy going, totally down for that. Um, you know, I do individual counseling as well as uh, testing assessment, that type of stuff. So if you're interested in doing something like that, I've got my information in the chat box. Um, you can reach me that way. Um, and then alternatively, of course, with all things Sigma Nu related, you're more than welcome uh, to reach out for that type of stuff. So feel free to record that. And we'll jump into our presentation tonight. So with talks uh, that are more along the lines of uh, working with organizations, uh, depending on the situation, I may or may not use like a PowerPoint. So personally, I find PowerPoints to be kind of boring. I don't like to talk at people. I'd rather have a conversation. So, you know, y'all get enough PowerPoints, I'm sure, in class. So we're going to keep this more along the lines of a, uh, a conversation, so to speak. And then, of course, if you'd like any additional information of what we're talking about from um, our talk tonight, just again, feel free to reach out and I can send you either some handouts or something of that nature. So uh, jumping right into things, I see we've got like 22, 22 brothers in here. So let's jump around real quick and just kind of introduce yeah. ourselves. Uh, I'm Martin Martinez, IOTA Lambda 516. And I am a freshman at JSU. Cool, Martin. Good to have you here with us. <laughs> what's your What's your major? We'll toss that into. We can do the the name, uh, you know, initiate number, and then major. Uh, my major is applied electrical engineering, but you know, 
everybody wants to be an engineer at first. So we'll see how that goes. But as of now, that's my major. Hey, right, cool beans. Um, Jesus Lopez, uh, I'm a senior. Uh, I own a Lambda 517. I'm a criminal justice major. Very cool. Glad to have you here, Jesus. Uh, Carlos Gonzalez, I'm a senior and my I'm majoring in finance. Very good, Carlos. Good to have you here. Uh, my name is Ray Little. I own a Lambda 515. I'm an emergency management major. Okay, good to have you, Ray. Yes, sir. I'm Thomas Braswell. I land at a Lambda 513 and I'm a history major. Very cool. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Addison Cook. I'm a senior history major and I'm an Iota Lambda 491. I don't know any Addison Cooks. No, I'm just kidding. What's up, Addison? <laughs> Uh, I'm Philip Bossy, Iota Lambda 506, and I'm a sophomore and a nursing major. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Uh, I'm Parker Vezertes, uh, Iota Lambda uh, 514, and I'm a communications major. Okay, very good, Parker. Nice to meet you here. My name is Hi, I'm Aaron, Iota 512. I'm a freshman music education major. Okay. He's a kid. Very cool. All right, Aaron. You're going to let me talk now? Okay, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carlos Cruz. I'm Iota, Iota Lambda 498. I'm a criminal justice major. Hey, Carlos. Uh, my name is Pierce Altman. I'm a sophomore. Iota Lambda 501. Uh, I'm a sociology major right now, but that's getting changed after this year, so we'll see. Okay. Yeah, there's uh, you know, there's never a wrong time to you know switch majors if you're just not feeling the one you're in. So that is a okay, man. Good to good to see you again, Pierce. Hey, you too. my name is Tony. I'm a uh, out of Lambda 497, and uh, I'm an integrated studies slash business major. Okay, very cool. My name is Ryan Peterson. Uh, I own a Lambda 508, and I'm a film major. Very cool, Ryan. And thanks again for the invite to coming to speak and everything. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Ben Fico. I own a Lambda 496, and I'm a nursing major. Very good. Good to see you, Ben. Hey, Torsten. Uh, it's Caleb Martin, four double eight. I'm a senior in computer information systems. Very good. Good to see you, Caleb. I'm Evan Brandau. I would learn to five ten, and I'm a finance major, a junior. Very cool. Good to have you, Evan. Let's see. Is that is that everybody? I haven't been keeping count or anything. <laughs> Well, cool. We will continue on. If anyone was left out, just chime in whenever you'd like to, and, and we'll just pick back up. But uh, yeah, so jumping into wellness, um, what what is wellness? And just anybody feel free to chime in. Is it the state of your mental health, maybe? 
that could be an option, yeah. It could be mental health, physical health, um, you know, just a variety of different types um, of health, I guess, could fit into wellness. You know, mood, which is also tied to mental health, can tie to wellness as well. So when we think about mental health specifically in the wellness paradigm or the worldview in which we look at it. Um, one way to kind of conceptualize mental health is like, okay, we've got mental health here, but then we've got different streams that go into it. So like you might have, you know, career, school, relationships, nutrition, sleep, you know, all of these different things that pour into essentially our mental health or our wellness, right? And we know that uh, when we tend to have difficulty in, you know, one or a couple of these different sections that can begin to impact, you know, our social life, our academic life, our work life, you know, essentially, you know, it can become a snowball effect and kind of pour into uh, disrupting our day-to-day -day lives, right? And so, we're going to talk about tonight a couple of tips to be able to help maintain that and just some things to be mindful of. And we'll also talk about, okay, well, when would be, you know, a good time to perhaps, uh, you know, speak with someone like a professional or, you know, something like that. Because part of this is breaking away this from the stigma uh, that we may have been like kind of raised in or conditioned by in like the media. Uh, I don't know about any of you guys, but you know, when I was growing up in some circumstances, you know, whenever somebody started to talk about like mental health, they might be like, oh, well, you know, people who go to see a therapist or a counselor, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, they're crazy or, oh, you know, there's something wrong with them. And, you know, that kind of vibe, I guess you could say. Has anybody ever experienced that? Or been in a situation like that? Yes. Right, and so it's uh, you know difficult when we we grow up kind of around that attitude. But in actuality, if we think about it at a core level, our mental health can be the sole determining factor of our success in all other aspects of life. So if we were to think about, um, you know, how mental health may affect the job, right? So in order to be a, you know, an exceptional engineer, one has to be able to know the skills to be able to do it, right? Which involves critical thinking and the use of our brain. Um, you know, if our brain's not in tip-top shape and is affected by, uh, you know, either different symptoms or uh, different biological processes uh, that may be impacting it, then we can't do our job, right? Right, so that's kind of our foundational starting point is that when we look at wellness, uh, most times it really does come from, you know, mental health as well as our physical well-being. Okay, so jumping into some tips and tricks. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the impact of uh, just being active, physical activity, you know, things of that nature, right? Um, and feel free to use the, I guess it's the little hand raising thing if you don't want to chime in, uh, or you can type in the, check, the uh, chat box, you know, we can use that too. Um, how many of us are doing something active like on a day-to-day -day basis and that could be like going to the gym doing some sort of physical labor that could count as uh you know exercise to an extent going on walks you know something like that so i see tony tony's got his hand raised um we've got some other hands being raised i can only see so many people in here so I'll, just kind of call them, but yeah, I see Martin and then some other people on the extended chat there. So uh, from a personal standpoint, I try to go to the gym at least a couple of times a week just in order to stay active. Uh, you know, I'm actively 
working towards, uh, you know, some different like weight loss goals and things of that nature, but also it's important to manage like anxiety, you know, and basic day-to-day stress. So when we exert physical effort into things, or we do something like a workout or even like a brisk walk or a high intensity work situation, uh, essentially we're release, releasing endorphins in our brain, which allows better uh, methods on a biological level uh, in order for our brain to activate the areas uh, that help us with providing some relief, right? And so I'm sure that you know, you may have experienced if you are a, a relatively active person that, you know, getting that type of release helps with, you know, relieving some anxiety, some stress, you know, things of that nature, right? And so let's say you're not an active person. Like, let's say, you know, you may be out of shape or you may have like some goals that you'd like to work on you know, in terms of becoming more active, you know, getting into the gym or doing some sort of home workout. So there's a couple of different options there to help get us on that uh, physical, I guess, activation of our uh, path to wellness, right? So we could start with, you know, the basics, you know, go for a walk. It doesn't have to be like a mile or anything like that, just exerting some energy and working towards becoming more active, right? So sometimes we get it in our heads um, that we have to do all of these things at one time and it has to be perfect and all of that stuff, right? So we want to reel all of that back in and take it back to the basics. We want to take it just a step at a time. And that we could apply that same concept to, you know, work situation, chores, uh, school, you know, things of that nature, because it oftentimes we look at things, you know, kind of as like an all or nothing perspective, like I'm either going to do all these things my way now, or I'm just not going to do them. And there might be consequences from that, right? So reeling this back into the idea of uh, taking small steps towards, you know, being more active, more physically active, which will in turn help us become more mentally active and fit. Um, consider, you know, taking small steps like going on a walk. Uh, you could do some home workout videos. I mean, there's everything from, um, you know, apps that you can use for free. Um, I know that there are several uh, people that I know personally that they do um, like YouTube dance videos. You know, you can get as creative as you want with this, as long as we're attempting to do something to become more active, sweat, and get those endorphins going, right? Um, now, let's say you're already super active and you go to the gym. Um, consider using um, some of that stress energy or some of that anxiety energy and use that uh, to funnel into, you know, your workout. Now, we're not, I'm not saying that like, you know, you should overdo it or anything like that, but, you know, that helps make the difference when it's like, okay, you know, I'm doing these bicep curls and, you know, I'm thinking about just letting go of some of this stress that's been bugging me all day. And at the completion of your set, you know, that's it. The set's done. You've kind of out processed that or out process that as you're going along and that may help relieve some symptoms as well. Um, so before we move on to the next topic, does anybody have any, uh, you know, personal experiences that they'd like to share or any uh, tips and tricks of things to get started and being more active or any questions? So the floor is uh, open. Uh, well, per- well, personally, um, the hardest part of doing just about anything is getting up in the morning and just, you know, going out about your day. Um, I know my I myself struggle with this sometimes, especially having to wake up at like five in the morning every day. Um, but what really helps is staying committed to one thing. That way, like everything else will just seem pretty easy. Like I myself, I try to go to the gym almost every day. And uh, because what, if I don't, I feel really bad about myself. Uh, <laughs> But just staying committed to like one thing and 
everything will just come together. Things will seem just a little bit easier. And that way, like, you can focus on the things you need to be doing. Because you already focus on one thing. Might as well be focused on the other things you know you have to do. Yeah, so those are great points, Carlos. Um, you know, going back to the idea of certain situations where we may have to be up uh, early. So like, say, for example, if you've got like PT or, you know, something that's like RTC or sports related, or e even if you just prefer to get up early, um, taking that first step in committing to the process of change can go, you know, leaps and bounds, you know, wherever you want it to go, really. Um, a mental health hack in starting your day off the right way is to actually get up and make your bed. And so, you know, how is this a mental health hack? How does this have anything to do with anything? Okay, so when you make your bed, you are accomplishing a goal and you're triggering a reward processing system in your brain that allows you to be set up to complete the next thing. So the next thing after making your bed could be taking a shower or putting on clothes or, you know, whatever the case is, but it begins the process of reinforcing our behaviors at a very early point in the day. And so that could eventually snowball into like doing homework assignments that you've been procrastinating the entire semester or, uh, you know, doing catching up on fraternity related stuff like philanthropy hours or paying dues or, you know, whatever the case may be there. Um, so that really helps set us up. And so, Going back to like what Carlos had mentioned, you know, just making that commitment to saying, OK, well, I'm going to do this and taking that first step that that is also important in this process, because in order to complete tasks, we have to at least be at a minimum, uh, you know, committed to completing the tasks. Right. Cool. So. We'll use that as a segue into our next little area, uh, which is going to be sleep. You know, so hopefully, you know, we're taking some notes or uh, I see we're recording the session, so you can always go back and rewatch this uh, if you need to as well. So let's talk about sleep. Okay, who in here has a bedtime? And just uh, if you do, just toss it in the chat box. Just and if you don't, that's that's okay. You know, there's no like right or wrong response to this. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of AMs, got some PMs. Okay, so we've got some early, early bedtime people, some late bedtime people, some middle of the day bedtime people. <laughs> Yeah, so we might have, when it happens, it happens. That is that is a good response, Evan. Sometimes we just pass out, right? <laughs> that might be, that might be good or bad. Okay, so midnight. Okay, cool. I appreciate your participation in the chat. Um, this helps give me kind of an idea of where to go with this. Okay, so when we're functioning throughout the day. It, it's imperative. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm just watching that chat box. Okay, so it's imperative that we're able to get sleep at some point, right? So some of us might work like first shift, second shift, third shift. So it might vary depending on you know a work situation or um, you know social situations like parties or you know whatever the case may be, right? So. It's important that we try to set 
some sort of consistency uh, with our sleep in order to regulate our body, right? Because going back to this, you know, we have all of these different things that pour into our wellness and our mental health wellness as well, right? So like, say for example, even if you're consistently going to sleep, um, you know, at midnight or 10 p.m. or or even like maybe, you know, sometime in the a.m., as long as we're consistent with that and getting, you know, at least somewhere between, you know, six to 10 hours, you know, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, depending on your body type, um, that will help us in getting ourselves more focused and conditions ourselves to better routine, right? So routine plays a lot into our mental health and wellness as well, right? If we have, uh, you know, like an entire week where things are incredibly chaotic and inconsistent, that may cause additional anxiety, right? Which sometimes we might have weeks that are like that. But if we can at least get into, you know, good bedtime routines or good morning routines, uh, that will help alleviate stress as well, as well as anxiety. Um, But yeah, one more thing on sleep and then we'll move on. So uh, another type of mental health hack uh, when it comes to going to sleep is to uh, be able to condition our minds into approaching the process of sleep just in general. So what that could look like is a few different things. First of all, um, anytime we're like laying in bed and trying to go to sleep and we look at a phone or a screen, that potentially sets us back at least 15 to 45 minutes-ish on actual sleep, right? So, you know, a couple of different things fall into that uh, variable, such as, uh, you know, the condition in which we're going to sleep and things of that nature as well. But another hack is to be able to, you know, put our phone down or go ahead and put it on, you know, the alarm or do not disturb or whatever the case is, and just really try to focus on the darkness and, you know, just trying to go to sleep, right? So that's going to be our little area on sleep. Okay, any questions, comments on sleep? Okay, moving right along. Okay, so who in here experiences anxiety? me 100 percent me right so it, it's really a trick question everybody in here experiences anxiety there's not a single person that does it <laughs> uh, now you know the the levels of course um when we think of anxiety and even depression to an extent um anxiety and depression are considered to be like the common colds of uh you know mental health right so everybody experiences it it's just to what degree do we experience it based off of either experiences genetic disposition uh you know pre-existing health conditions things of that nature right and so i'm going to share with you guys a cool technique to help uh, bring us back to the center in order to um, hopefully create a grounded, you know, feeling to where we relieve the anxiety for a moment in order to, um, get us back on track. Right. Because, uh, if you do experience anxiety, you know, more so, uh, you know, on the, like the moderate to severe side, then you may have experienced, uh, like a panic attack or an anxiety attack, or even, you know, on the milder side, become so nervous that like, you just become frozen. You're like, well, what do I do? You know? that kind of thing, right? And so uh, we're going to do a cool activity now. Um, This is something that you guys can do wherever you're at right now. So I just want you to find an object. It could be like your phone or a pen or a video game controller or, uh, you know, whatever you might have that you, something you can hold in your hand, right? And I'll 
I'll use this pen. So I'll, I'll also participate, right? Okay, so this technique is called grounding, right? So this can be typically used when we become either overwhelmed or anxious or super stressed out and our mind tends to go, you know, a couple of different directions, right? And so when you've got your object handy, um, which I'll give everybody a second to, to just find some sort of object. And then we'll go from there. Okay, so moving right along. Everybody got their object? Cool, we're moving on. So, in your object, um, and we can do this in the chat box, you know, so everybody doesn't have to, you know, talk at the same time or anything. Um, I want you to tell me, what does your object look like? Okay. Cool. So we got some some objects going. Okay. So we're doing the video game controller. Right? That's good. Rectangle. Rectangle. I can't talk. <laughs> Let's see blue in a cone. Is it ice cream? Let's see square brown and full of cash. I wonder what that could be. Let's see, green, rock, cloudy, okay. Cool. So now I want you to tell me what the object feels like. So texture, you know, we're, you know, we're using touch now. So we've talked about what it looks like. Now what does it feel like? Okay, so smooth, crunchy, solid, rough, very smooth, okay. Bumpy. Light, okay. Sticky, yep. Okay, cool. So does it does your object make any kind of sounds? So like, you know, even though it's a pen, it makes a little clicky sound, you know, that kind of thing. Or I guess I could, you know, use it like a drumstick or something. Okay, quiet sounds, voices, sounds like plastic. Makes it sound like you're walking on grass. Okay. Cool, cool. Okay, so does it smell like anything? You know, which, you know, I'm not going to like smell my pen, but <laughs> you might have, uh, you know, something to eat that's your object or, you know, something like that or something leathery like a wallet or. Okay, so no smells. And then of course the, the last, <laughs> smells like bananas. Um, and then of course the last thing would be taste, but you know, I'm not gonna ask you to, you know, eat your object unless it's food or something. <laughs> um, okay, so if we think about it, you know, we've just spent like the last like five minutes talking about 
the smell, sight, taste, and sounds of your object, right? And short of focusing on, you know, this presentation, you were focused predominantly on your object, right? And so in situations where we may become anxious and everything starts to move really fast or our brain starts to go, uh, you know, a million different directions, if we can get an object and utilize our senses to activate our brain to think about what the object is, we can use this, uh, this simple object as a means to pivot and reprocess the situation, right? And so essentially your object serves as a sense distraction in order to bring us back to the moment. When we get back to the moment, that is when we can utilize uh, you know, our rational thinking to think about, okay, what is it exactly that I am you know, just freaking out about or becoming anxious about, you know, however we tend to call it, right? And so is everybody following me as far as like where we are? That, that's step one is the five senses. Is everybody, everybody on the same page? Okay, so moving right along on that, when we get to our grounded center, you know, after we've focused on the object and our senses with the object, that's when we take the next step in rational thinking. Anxiety, like 99.5% of the time, stems from fear, okay? You know, the fear of, oh, well, what would people think? The fear of what if I make the wrong choice? The fear of what if I fail and, you know, can't do whatever it is that I'm trying to do? You know, all of those inner thoughts that might come in the form of either voices or, you know, negative thoughts about ourselves, things of that nature, right? And so one way to help deal with anxiety in situations like that, you know, when we've used our grounding technique is to take a moment and think about fear versus fact. Okay, what do I know about the situation? So I'll give you kind of a crazy example, right? Like, let's say, for example, I've got my, you know, I've got my cell phone here, right? You know, I am horribly afraid that this cell phone is going to, like, sprout some legs and run across the room at me and attack me, right? Let's just say that's my just outrageous fear that causes a lot of anxiety, right? So in this situation, you know, after I've grounded myself using my object, I can flip the switch and think, okay, what do I know about this cell phone? It's clearly an inanimate object. It hasn't attacked me yet. I've had this phone for months. You know, I think if it was going to attack me, then it would probably have done that. And you know, this would be like some kind of crazy horror movie or something, right? So, you know, that's kind of rationalizing the situation, knowing what the facts are, right? And so if we were to think of this kind of like how a child might be afraid of the boogeyman in the closet, we know that the closet is dark and scary until, you know, you walk over to the closet and you flip the light switch and it's like, oh, you know, that menacing figure was like a coat hanger right <laughs> so utilizing you know that notion of thinking about okay you know fact versus fear what am i afraid of is it something that can be solved today or is it something that i may need to work on because most of the time when we become overwhelmed and we start to get anxious that's when our mind starts to go a million different directions and we either you know freeze or just give up or, you know, become hard on ourselves and all of that stuff, right? And so just to kind of summarize thing, two-step process. Step one, we find our object. We use our senses to identify the object. Use that as a distraction to bring ourselves back to center. And then we flip the switch and we look at fact versus fear. Everybody following? And you can just type it in the, the chat box if you understand. If you don't, then I can break it down a different way.
And then, of course, you've got this recording um, to look back on if you'd like to. Cool. So we've got some thumbs up, some yes, and some we, and some <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, so very good. So these are just practical tips to be able to help with some mental health stuff. So moving right along, um, let's talk about food and mood, all right? So little known fact, you know, we've got neurotransmitters in our brain. You know, people typically refer to them as like the chemicals in our brain. Uh, a few common neurotransmitters would be like serotonin, dopamine, you know, things of that nature, right? And so most of the time when we think about mental health, um, most of those different symptoms tend to originate from our brain, right? And so an interesting fact that's not well known is that there's a lot of neurotransmitter uh, production and blockage that occurs in our gut bacteria, in our stomach. So it's interesting how uh, different types of bacteria affect, you know, the mood aspect of that when we're going um, and thinking about different things that affect our mental health, right? So food is pretty impactful in how, you know, we tend to feel like I'm sure, you know, sometimes when you have a lot of carbs or something, you might start to feel sluggish and then you start to feel, you know, just depending on your body type and biological makeup, you might feel depressed or you might become anxious. Um, of course, we know how uh, caffeine, uh, taurine, ginseng, you know, different things that might be found in like energy supplements or energy drinks, soda, coffee, how that stuff kind of affects our mental health. Uh, caffeine has a tendency to increase anxiety. Um, now, sometimes depending on how your body reacts, caffeine can cause the reverse effect. You can actually have a caffeine crash uh, rather than get the boost from it. And then, of course, um, you know, with alcohol and things of that nature, that can impact uh, our mental health as well. So, you know, depending on, um, you know, if you drink or even if you don't drink, you might use, um, you know, other types of like medication or substances or whatever the case may be. Uh, you may have different effects depending on what you ingest, right? And so, those are just some things to be mindful of. Um, interestingly enough, staying hydrated has a serious impact on mental health as well. So, you know, continue to drink water. If you're not drinking water, I'd encourage you to drink more water. Um, and I'll speak a little bit on uh, the element of bread and how that impacts mental health, and then we'll move on to the next section. Okay, so essentially, uh, there's significant clinical evidence that suggests that bread, um, which you know typically converts to sugar, you know depending on, um, impacts our mental health in several different ways. Um, and if you want to read more on this, I'm going to type a book down here for y'all to check out. Called wheat belly, but uh, yeah, essentially, uh, one of the leading researchers in this particular topic um, has conducted clinical trials on different populations, ranging from just like you know people with common mental health symptoms, all the way to uh, people with autism or people that experience dementia. Uh, throughout these clinical trials, um, clinical trials, sorry, um, he took certain populations and he completely removed wheat and bread from their diet, right? Now this isn't a crusade against bread. This is just, you know, informing you guys of, you know, different mental health um, implications from this. So he took bread out of, you know, these different populations diet, right? And it began to show significant uh, decrease in different levels. Um, and then with the different uh, symptoms that would decrease, you know, with the dementia uh, patients, 
their symptoms uh, would decrease, less uh, behaviors and meltdowns with autism populations, um, and just a wide variety of different things. So, you know, again, this isn't like a crusade against bread or anything of that nature, but rather uh, just something to be mindful of as like another mental health hack, you know. So, you know, be wary of the bread products because they do, in fact, impact mood. Um, so, yeah, shifting right over to our next topic. Oh, it's Noah's bedtime. <laughs> there you go. Let's see. So just to kind of wrap all of this up into a big package, um, when we begin to notice that things are spiraling out of control or beginning to head that way, you know, just in terms of, you know, anxiety, feeling depressed, feeling sad, feeling upset, obsessive, you know, relationship issues, that kind of thing, uh, then we might want to take a step back and think, okay, you know, what am I doing that may be impacting some of these behaviors, right? And so typically when we get to that point where it's starting to affect either relationships or work or social, uh, you know, situations, things of that nature, we want to take a step back and think, okay, do I need to seek additional assistance for this, right? And so uh, the point of like mental health counseling is not to, you know, put you on, you know, different prescriptions to possibly help with the symptoms. Because if, uh, you know, we think about it with just prescriptions in general, um, some people do require, you know, medication in order to create, you know, either more neurotransmitters or less to help with symptoms. But we really have to think about the side effects when it comes down to uh, what those medications may do. So say, for example, um, you know, if you may be taking an antidepressant and not necessarily being engaging in any kind of counseling or therapy, uh, you will experience the side effects of that antidepressant and you'll, you won't learn coping skills. You know, it may assist with relieving some of the symptoms, but ultimately, you know, should you quit the medication, the symptoms are just going to come back because we haven't learned how to, you know, necessarily, you know, work through them or deal with them or, you know, whatever the case may be, right? And so when it comes down to the medication aspect of things, that's not uh, typically what counseling is about. It's about learning new uh, coping skills, processing, and also building up parts of your life and working towards uh, what we call self-actualization or who it is that you would like to be rather than who you feel chained to, essentially, if that makes sense. Um, and so, you know, with that being said, uh, the point of, you know, clinical mental health counseling isn't necessarily to give advice, but rather to process and to collaborate on how to make you know, your life, the best life that it could be, you know, while also, of course, medically treating the symptoms with evidence-based practices, right? Um, so, you know, how do we get access to counseling? Well, of course, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm more than happy to work with anybody who may be experiencing the different things on that level, um, but this isn't a talk to promote the counseling clinic by any means. So there are different resources that, um, you have access to that are available at JSU for free. Uh, there is the counseling center um, that is over by Mason Hall, if you're familiar with the music department. Um, it's around Trustee Circle. You can set up an appointment with either a, a licensed professional counselor or a clinical social worker and you know get into different counseling and whatnot. So it's 100% uh, confidential. Um, you know, you just call up there and make a meeting. They also have different uh, groups, I think, that are related to, uh, I think, like substance abuse or, you know, some other things. So if you feel like, you know, working on something that might be related to relapse prevention or substance related, they also have services for that, too. So in the meantime, uh, you know, a few things to consider. 
you know, just to wrap things up and talk about these different tips, you know, we talked about the grounding technique, you know, with our object and, you know, redirecting, right, bringing us down to the, the core and looking at, you know, fact versus fear, right? We talked about, you know, the importance of routine and setting a bedtime. We talked about the importance of, um, you know, how food affects mood and different relationships and thoughts and symptoms, right? And then, of course, uh, we talked about, you know, additional resources that are available. Um, and then, of course, um, there are other online uh, resources as well. Um, there's, of course, the Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, that has 24-7 uh, access with uh, crisis counselors available. Um, should you feel the need to use that? Let's see, and I'm going to list that number in our group chat too. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so that number is in there. And I'm going to list another one. I can pull it up on this. Okay, while I'm looking up the, these numbers, how's everybody doing? Has this been beneficial? Just kind of eh. Yeah, I'd say it's been beneficial. Um, no, like I deal with like um, I deal with anxiety attacks and stuff like that. Like I have a panic disorder, so these are just kind of like different ways to kind of cope with it too that I've found helpful. So I'm gonna have to try some of this stuff. Yeah, very good. Yes, and you know, like I said, these these techniques and different hacks are, are helpful in helping to manage those symptoms. Um, you know, panic disorder can become quite overwhelming at times and it can, it can pose challenges at times too. And so when we can kind of take the reins on some of those symptoms and practice towards, uh, you know, more regulation with the symptoms, it's amazing what we can wield, um, you know, in terms of productivity, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, I think it was like a fame, I think it was a quote by like Carrie Fisher, you know, the, the woman who plays princess Leia in the star Wars movies, uh, she has, or had, uh, bipolar disorder. Right. And so when people think about bipolar disorder, they're like, Oh my gosh, you know, bipolar disorder, which most people's, you know, perception of what that is, is completely the opposite, not the right idea, thanks to media. But anyway, um, you know, essentially, you know, one with bipolar disorder, you know, if they can manage and almost manipulate the mania involved with that, I mean, imagine the productivity that one could have if they could become like manic in a positive way towards something that's productive. Um, you know, one example would be like, um, I've got a colleague that he has bipolar disorder and he was able to, you know, learn the right coping skills in order to manipulate his uh, manic episodes into like schoolwork, making straight A's like it's wild. So, you know, we don't always want to think about, you know, a diagnosis if we may have one as being something that is inherently negative. Um, and then also in terms of like mental health diagnoses in general, um, short of some of the more, uh, you know, severe like developmental type of things or, uh, you know, neuro uh, psychological types of disorders. We really don't want to think of, uh, you know, mental health disorders as being, you know, permanent labels per se, because really a diagnosis is based off of symptom management. And if we learn enough coping skills to manage the symptoms, we may not report or present 
symptoms to even have a diagnosis of the disorder anymore to begin with. So it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting, you know, spectrum, so to speak, when it comes to mental health. And with, you know, everything uh, related to that, you know, going back to that idea of, you know, everybody experiences mental health symptoms. It's just to what degree do we experience them? Um, you know, that can present its own challenges, but also we can seek assistance for those challenges by learning new uh, ways of coping, new ways of processing and things of that nature. Um, let's see. I was OK. I was never able to actually find the, the number for whatever reason, but I'm going to link the website down here. Um, let's see, this is the Trevor Project. Uh, this is, that's a hotline, um, that is geared predominantly towards, uh, like LGBT plus youth and adults. So it's like a little more niche, uh, depending on your, uh, you know, orientation or identity. Um, and then of course the, uh, suicide prevention lifeline. Uh, is also inclusive as well. So there's a few different resources there. Um, but yeah, so we'll take the last couple of minutes here uh, because I don't want to keep you guys too long. We've got like a fire truck or something going by. <laughs> but uh, let's take a minute to to just ask. We could do some just open Q&A. Uh, you know, I'm more than happy to uh, illuminate any types of uh, mental health myths or anything of that nature, attempt to answer any of your questions to the best of my ability or provide, uh, you know, the right avenue for you to be able to find those answers. So just feel free to use the box um, or you can just chime in on the chat. Let's see, we've got, hey, it's Lumpkin, finally able to join. And Griffin is here too. What is up, guys? <laughs> Let's see. So yeah, the floor is open to any questions and I'll be watching the chat here for a second. What made you want to take like mental health and all that so seriously when you came to JSU? Okay, so that's a, that's a great question. Okay, so this is gonna sound crazy, right? But in the ninth grade, um, my girlfriend at the time bought me a used psychology textbook. <laughs> and, you know, because I just offhandedly mentioned like, I'm interested in people and how they work and relationships. And like, I was always like one of those go-to people in high school to just, you know, listen to other people vent or, you know, try to give, you know, opinion or advice, you know, which is actually like the opposite of counseling. But anyway, um, so she gives me this book and I read it and I'm like, damn, that's some really cool stuff. I think that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> and so, um, you know, rest of high school kind of went through there, but then, um, you know, a little bit towards senior year, uh, that kind of went to the back of my mind and I was just interested in, uh, you know, making the drum line for the Southerners. So all focus shifted to that. And then when they were like, you have to choose a major, I'm like psychology and jumped right back into all the mental health and behavioral stuff. But um, I think what makes me passionate just about mental health in general is that we are exposed to a significant amount of trauma uh, and different stressors and, you know, life things that are constantly evolving with, you know, the different generations that keep coming up. Right. And so you know, with that being said, and kind of dipping back into some of the stigma we were talking about earlier, um, a lot of people don't really ask for help until it's too late. And so I was thinking, well, if, you know, I could be there to be able to better assist and collaborate with other people on, you know, managing mental health symptoms and treating these different psychiatric disorders, 
uh, then that would give them an opportunity to either, uh, you know, fully undergo, you know, that positive change to essentially recreate themselves in the way that they would like to, you know, be able to function in society um, or work on different problem areas that might be um, from their own experience, you know, when it comes to like, you know, being a victim of trauma or uh, experiencing, you know, some psychological distress, you know, growing up or being exposed to different things. But um, essentially, I feel that everybody has the right to be able to feel and process things in a way that will ultimately make them uh, more successful and be able to have that self-actualization experience and be able to live life to the fullest. That was a really long, drawn-out explanation, but I, I hope that answers that. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a great response. It's wild that you decided a career path on a book, <laughs> but I mean, it paid off in the end. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's wild. Um, you know, interestingly enough, um, I think if we wanted to examine it a little bit further, one of my favorite books growing up uh, or stories is A Christmas Carol, right? And so if you're familiar with it, you, you know what the plot is. But if you're not familiar with it, essentially this, you know, miserly old grumpy dude in London in the 1800s who's just like a terrible person, you know, is able to undergo such significant change in a short amount of time and be able to, you know, essentially recreate his life at such a late age and then, you know, bestow joy or, you know, good things to, to the people after having this life changing experience by be, being visited by, you know, ghosts. So, yeah, I think that kind of plays into it as well with like, you know, at a foundational level of like really liking the idea that people have the capacity to change no matter what the circumstance or what they've experienced and just really being able to hone in and focus on that. So that's like an even further <laughs> explanation. But uh, but yeah, very cool. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? And uh, for the guys that missed, if you go back and you rewind like 30 minutes or so in the presentation, there's a super cool coping skill for anxiety. So, you know, the rewatch value is, you know, two thumbs up maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so if you do have any other questions, uh, you know, about Sigma Nu stuff or uh, counseling or, you know, any way I could possibly help you guys, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, career development, advising, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, just feel free to reach out. You've got my number. It's all the way back at the top of the group chat. Um, I'm just, just going to copy and paste that again at the bottom of the group chat, just so y'all have got it again. Um, on the Sigma Nu side of things, I'd really like to be able to come out uh, and hang out with you guys at like a chapter meeting or an event or something. So um, just to kind of give you some perspective on workload stuff right now, things have been absolutely crazy uh, with one of my contracts. I do a contract with the Department of Human Resources. And so, um, you know, this kind of plays into the last time why we weren't able to meet live and in person the last time. Uh, was that I got a call to have to sit in on an emergency child abuse hearing. And so that became a very complex situation. But uh, between that and then I'm also in school right now working on my PhD in uh, counselor education. Time is a little bit tight, but I think that you know, making time for my brothers is equally as important and also serves as what we like to call self-care time. So. I'm more than happy to grab lunch or, like I said, hang out at a chapter meeting or help out with uh, the candidates, you know, just whatever you guys may need help with, uh, just reach out. I'm happy to assist. And then, of course, um, 
we do have an, an alumni advisory board. Um, at this point in time, everybody should be familiar with uh, Rich Cranford. He's the active chapter advisor, so he's like the most, I guess, direct form of contact with the board. Um, then, of course, you you can reach out to me. That's perfectly fine too. But we've also got um, other advisors, uh, such as Sprout, uh, Tyler Brown, uh, Andy Glasscock. Uh, and some other guys, and we're about to have uh, um, Palmer and uh, Jared Sharp join us on that board as well. So they're, you know, a little closer in uh, generational, you know, I guess we could say like initiate number or whatever we want to call it to you guys. So that'll help kind of extend that net w network out so that we can uh, really get some stuff done. But uh, I say all that to say, uh, Thank you so much for having me out. I hope this was productive. And like I said, the numbers in the chat box, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you've all made a fantastic decision joining Sigma Nu Fraternity. You know, we're a fraternity of individuals, so it's always wonderful to see a nice diverse group of guys, um, you know, working together from their you know, unique backgrounds and, you know, different paths of life, because that's, you know, ultimately what Sigma News is all about. But yeah, so don't hesitate to reach out. It was good seeing you guys. Thanks again, Ryan, for having me. I'll stick around, uh, you know, for a couple of minutes if anybody has any, you know, more, I guess, uh, personal questions or anything of that nature. But other than that, uh, that's all I got, guys. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you again. We really appreciate it. It was very informative. We really, uh, it was a really good league session. We really appreciate it. Yeah, you're certainly welcome. And uh, um, I'm sure you know, but we do have that. Um, we have that car show coming up for uh, for shipwreck that we have. So if you wanted to um, come by and just kind of hang out with the brothers and stuff like that, then I mean, you're of course more than welcome to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I plan on coming and checking it out. I, I forgot to mention, like, I live in Jacksonville, so that's. <laughs> I'm pretty accessible when it comes to this stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. That would be awesome. I'm glad to see the, the car show. The car show is back. Hey, Torsten, can I ask you about uh, your future?